Lee Marine Achi was born in Honolulu, Hawaii on August 21st, 1979. She was the only child of Donald Achi and Vicki Felton. Donald and Vicki had both been in the military. The two met while stationed in California and in 1977, they got married. Eventually, the Achi settled in Honolulu, Hawaii, where they had their daughter. They would live in Hawaii for a couple years, but the marriage didn't last long. By 1981, the couple had divorced. Following this, Donald was relocated to Germany, where he continued to serve in the military. Meanwhile, Vicky chose to leave the armed forces. She instead moved to Tupelo, Mississippi and took Lee along with her. Tupelo, Mississippi is about three hours north of the state's capital. Most of the city's residents are families. For the most part, it's a safe place to live. Vicky had family here and she felt it was the perfect place for her and her daughter to start a new life. Despite the distance between Lee and her father, the two remained very close. Lee would often take trips to Germany and spend time with her dad. She became very familiar with the German culture and she'd even learned a bit of the language. In 1991, Donald chose to move back to the US. He settled in Fort Myer, Virginia. This was still a 13 hour drive from Tupelo, but it was a lot closer than Germany. Family describes Lee as bubbly and energetic. Her favorite food was pizza, and she absolutely loved horses. Lee never missed a chance to try something new. She and her dad would visit the shooting range and go four-wheeling. Most girls her age wouldn't want to spend a day splashing around in the mud, but this didn't bother Lee one bit. Her parents say that she was adventurous and always kept an open mind. Lee would spend her junior high years at Tupelo Middle School. She was a good student and did especially well in math. According to the teachers, she was kind and sociable. By the summer of 1992, Lee was preparing to start the eighth grade. She didn't have a care in the world, and for the time being, life was good. In August of 1992, Lee would celebrate her 13th birthday. School hadn't started just yet, so she was still enjoying her vacation. Lee spent most of her time horseback riding and hanging with friends and family. By this time, she and her mother Vicky lived at 105 Honey Locust Drive. The small ranch-style home sat at the end of a cul-de-sac, and for a while, the house had a third resident. Vicky had been remarried to a man named Barney Yarborough. The marriage lasted a few years, but ultimately, they called it quits. The two separated a few weeks before Lee's 13th birthday. Barney moved out of the house and got his own place. August 27th, 1992 was a Thursday. Vicky woke up around 6.45 a.m. She saw that Lee was still asleep. She went outside to grab the newspaper and got a breath of fresh air. When she came back inside, Lee was now awake. The two sat down for breakfast and talked about their plans for the day. Lee was set to attend an open house at her middle school that day. Her grandmother would be taking her. Later that evening, she and Vicky planned to have dinner at Taco Bell. Just before 7.45 a.m., Vicky left for work. Her job was at a manufacturing company. The building was just one and a half miles from Honey Locust Drive. She had left for work many times, but today was different. Lee was now 13, and Vicky had decided to give her a bit of independence. For the first time ever, she was leaving her daughter home alone. Lee had always been responsible, so Vicky felt there wasn't much risk. Plus, she would be close by and could call the house from work. Vicky kissed her daughter goodbye and left out. It was 7.50 a.m. when Vicky arrived at work. Once there, she borrowed a weather radio that her boss had. Vicky was keeping track of Hurricane Andrew. The storm had made landfall a week earlier. The hurricane was now dying down, but Tupelo was getting heavy thunderstorms as a result. 
Since the night before, there had been rainfall in the area. Lee was not a fan of thunderstorms, and Vicky knew this. When she heard that more rain was headed towards Tupelo, she called home to check on Lee. Since the house phone had no caller ID, the mother and daughter had set up a special ring. This way, Lee would know it was Vicky that was calling. The system worked like this. Vicky would call and let the phone ring twice. She would then hang up and call back immediately after. But on this morning, Lee didn't pick up the phone. The special ring was tried once more, but there was still no answer. Vicky became concerned almost immediately. Something just didn't feel right. She had just left home and Lee was perfectly fine. What could be keeping her from answering the phone now? Vicky decided it was best to run back home and check on her daughter, just in case. It was shortly before 9 a.m. when Vicky left work en route to Honey Locust Drive. When she arrived back home, she noticed that the garage door was up and its lights had been activated. The light was set to stay on for only five minutes after the garage door was let up. This meant that someone had opened the garage door within the last few minutes. When Vicky reached the front door, she found that it was unlocked. As she turned the knob and entered the house, she found a disturbing scene. Vicky could see a pool of blood on the living room floor. This was accompanied by blood splatter on a wall close by. Of course, this threw Vicky into a panic. She began calling her daughter's name and frantically searching the house. When she reached Lee's room, she saw the child's favorite blanket crumpled up and thrown on the floor. Realizing her daughter was nowhere in the house, Vicky called the local police and reported Lee missing. When local PD arrived, they conducted their own search of the house. This turned up even more evidence of violence. In addition to the blood that Vicky found, there was also blood in Lee's bedroom, the master bedroom, and the upstairs bathroom. What police didn't find was evidence of a forced entry. Now Vicky says that she's positive she locked the door before she headed to work. As we mentioned, she found the door unlocked when she got back home. This led to the idea that Lee willingly let her attacker into the house. It seemed that the situation was becoming stranger by the minute. What police did know was that Lee Achi was still missing. On the same day that they received the report, a search of the area was conducted. Between 10 and 12 officers were assigned to the search near Honey Locust Drive. They brought in canines and combed the area for one and a half miles in each direction. The team searched through a heavily wooded area near the home. They also searched the nearby drainage ditch and local landfill. The initial search efforts were made difficult. Due to rainstorms passing in the area, the canine dogs were never able to pick up a scent. Within a couple days, the search grew even bigger. Citizens of Tupelo were now assisting, and police had helicopters scouring the area. Instead of just looking near Honey Locust Drive, the search had now expanded to include the entire city. Many participants began to feel that they were now looking for human remains, not a living person. As the weeks passed, even more effort was put forth to find the missing team. A $1,000 reward was offered for any information that could lead to Lee. Eventually, that amount was increased to $2,000. Police had even set up a special team to dig into the case. It was comprised of at least 12 investigators, all dedicated to solving the tragic mystery. Lee's mother, Vicky, had also taken some action. She had hired a private investigator to assist in the search. She also paid for ads to be placed in the local newspaper. It seems that this was an effort to attract new tips and new leads. But even with the entire city of Tupelo now looking for Lee, there were no new developments. Like many other stories we've covered, a lack of definite answers leads to an abundance of theories. Lee Achi's case is no different. One such theory is that Vicky's ex-husband, Barney Yarborough, was responsible. It was rumored that Barney had physically abused Lee during he and Vicky's relationship. 
Both Barney and Vicky deny these claims. It's also important to mention a package that was sent to the Honey Locust Drive address. This occurred on September 9th, just two weeks after Lee went missing. The box was addressed to Barney Yarborough, and it contained Lee's eyeglasses. A DNA test was performed on the stamps that were sealed to the box, but it seems that water was used as the adhesive, not saliva. This made the package untraceable. Nonetheless, Barney Yarborough was made to take a polygraph. In addition to passing that polygraph, he was also able to provide a valid alibi for the time Lee went missing. With that, he was ruled out as a suspect. Investigators believed the package was mailed simply as a distraction. Unfortunately, there was no way to determine who actually sent it. The most popular theory points to Lee's mother, Vicky. It's said that Vicky's behavior before and after Lee went missing was a little strange. Lee's father, Donald, received the news from Vicky firsthand. He said that his ex-wife failed to explain how serious the situation was. She led him to believe that Vicky had simply run away. He also noticed that Vicky shed no tears throughout the ordeal. For him, this was definitely a red flag. It seems that investigators may have felt the same way. They had Vicky take three separate polygraph tests. According to reports, she failed all of them. Despite this, Vicky maintains her innocence. She says that at this point, her only concern is finding her daughter. It's unclear if she's still a person of interest, but police do say that she's been cooperative in the investigation. It's coming close to 30 years since Lee Achi vanished from her home in Tupelo. There have been no confirmed sightings or official suspects. Really, the investigation has been an uphill battle. I mean, who could be responsible? Was the culprit a complete stranger or someone closer to home? Even with such a widespread search effort, no trace of the missing team was found. Where could she have possibly been taken? Hopefully, time will bring about answers to these questions. Lee's mother, Vicki, has since left the state of Mississippi. She relocated to Tecumseh, Michigan. A couple years after Lee went missing, she and Barney Yarborough's divorce was made official. Sadly, he passed away in December of 1996. Lee's father, Donald, would go on to remarry. He's always felt that his daughter died on the same day she disappeared. He continues to pray that the person responsible will be brought to justice. Lee Marine Achi was 13 years old when last seen. She stood at 4 foot 10 and weighed 95 pounds. She has blonde hair, hazel eyes, and a small birthmark on the back of her neck. If still alive today, she would be 41 years old. <laughs>